I can handle that much. You can fix that yourself, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I can fix this myself. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of my favorite verses, if you've been around North Lakes any time at all, you know that one of my favorite verses, if not my favorite, is John 10.10. 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I like the old version. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. I love that word, abundantly. And this is, this is a promise of God that, that He gives us. This is a good truth. And we need to grab onto that good truth. We need to hold on to that good truth. And remember that God said Jesus came to give us life and to give us life abundantly. Not just heaven. I mean, that's plenty, right? But life on this earth is abundant. That He came to give us that kind of a life. Uh, and yet, it's not the complete verse. Now, if you'll notice in that verse, there were three dots there, okay? What, any of you English majors, uh, can you tell me what those three dots mean? What's the word for that? Anybody know? Ellipses. ellipses. Some of you knew ellipses. And what ellipses means is there were words left out. There were words prior to that that were left out. And so I think it's only fair that we see the words that were left out of that verse. Okay, John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now that's not a feel good verse, is it? I mean, that's not one of those. And that's of course is why I like the last part of that verse. Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. But the truth is we have an enemy who comes to steal from us, to steal our joy, to rob us, to try to do uh, anything to us to get us away from Jesus Christ. So without putting that, that feel good part in its proper context, we miss some of what God has to say to us. We miss the fact that there is spiritual warfare going on out there, that we are in this great battle. We are a part of this battle between God and Satan, between good and evil. The battle is there and it is being fought. And if we don't realize that, we're on dangerous ground. Because if we just take that second part and take it out of context, we could be living like we're on vacation all the time, right? I just got the abundant life. I don't have to worry. Nobody's going to come against me. Everything's fine. And it's not. We know that Satan does come against us. He does. He is engaged in this spiritual warfare uh, between good and evil. The truth is that Jesus came so that we could experience the abundant life. But the enemy would like you to just claim that part and leave out the rest of it and uh, replace it with three little dots. You know, he wants us just to leave that part out. That would be fine with him. But we do have an enemy who comes to steal and comes to kill and comes to destroy. Now in this series that I'm calling Turn It Around, uh, we are looking at some of his primary weapons. We're looking at the lies that, Jesus, that uh, Satan gives us. Jesus said that Satan is a liar. He said the enemy speaks his native tongue. He speaks his native language, which is lies. Truth never comes out of the mouth of the enemy, but only lies. And he comes against us with deception. He twists the truth. He is a master manipulator. And so in this series, Turn It Around, I'm trying to identify some of the lies that Satan wants to feed us and turn them around and realize that we can be set free from those lies by the truth that's in Scripture. So each one of these lies we'll do each week, we will give the lie, we'll talk about the lie and, and open it up so that we can see it, bring it into the light so that we can see it, and then we'll look at Scripture that says, here's how you can be free from it. Here's how you can be free from that particular lie. So, because you see, when we believe his lies, Maybe it's something that we've been taught early on. Maybe we believe it just because a whole lot of other people believe it, and you don't want to be the only one. You don't ever want to be the only one, right? Everybody else is saying the sky is green, and you don't want to believe it, but everybody else believes it. There must be something wrong in my mind, and you begin to live that way. And we used a, we used a very insignificant lie last week as an illustration of this. 
We used a couple, but one of them, the carrot thing. Remember that? We, many of us have been taught since childhood that if you eat your carrots, you'll have better vision. And it's a lie. It's not true. It was made up by some English uh, pilots during World War II, and the Bugs Bunny cartoon writer picked up on it, and he inserted it into his Bugs Bunny cartoons. You get better eyesight if you eat carrots, and most people believe that. And it's just not true. It's a lie. It does not help your eyesight. If you don't believe that, look it up. Research it and see it. Now, we want to look, though. Uh, here's what happens. You believe that lie, that carrot lie, and then what? You begin to live by it. You tell your kids, you've got to eat your carrots so that you'll have better eyesight. It affects your life. It's insignificant. I'm not saying that's a problem. And I'm not, I don't, you know, let's not argue about whether or not it does. The point is, a lie can make you live a certain way. When you believe it, it attaches power to your life. And so we want to we look at some significant things, some significant ways that this dynamic is at play in your life. Maybe you believe the lie that God does not care about you. And so your heart, you allow your heart to become hard to Him. Maybe it, it makes you bitter, it makes you anger toward God. Uh, and maybe that happens during a time when you really do need him. You really do need to cry out to him, but you believe that lie. He doesn't really care. Uh, or maybe you believe the lie that you can never change. God tells you that lie. I mean, boy, Satan tells you that lie every day. You can't change. You just cannot do it. Uh, it's too late. You've sinned too much. You've done too many bad things. God will never forgive you. You've made such a mess of your life that you'll always be this way and you'll never change. Or maybe you believe the lie uh, uh, that uh, God just wants you to be happy. We're going to deal with this in detail next week. God just wants you to be happy. And so if you're, you, uh, anything that you do, if it doesn't make you happy, you don't do it because God wants you to be happy. And so maybe if you believe that lie, you don't fight through something you really did need to fight through. You don't fight for something that you really should have fought for and you lost it, you missed it because it wouldn't make you happy. And so if you believe that lie, it affects your life greatly. Or one of the worst ones, the lie that money will make you happy. And you sacrifice your family, you sacrifice your friends, you sacrifice your church because money is what I got to get my hands on and money is all that I care about. It will make me happy. Or the lie that you'll never be good enough. That mistakes can never be forgiven. You'll never be okay with God. You'll never be redeemed. And as a result of that, you live with guilt every day of your life. And every day the enemy tells you, you've blown it. You can't ever get forgiven. And if you keep believing that lie, and if you live with the weight of that guilt, it surfaces in anger. It always surfaces in anger. You get angry at yourself. You get angry at your family. You get angry at God. You get angry at your church. And worst of all, you get angry at your pastor. You know? <laughs> and so, so it always surfaces in all of this anger. So when you believe a lie, it has tremendous impl impl implications on our lives. Uh, so in this series, we're going to expose some of these, and we're going to embrace the truth that will set us free. Now, last week we talked about you don't have what it takes. You're just not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not capable enough. You don't have what it takes. And we learned last week that you can be set free from that lie by the truth in Philippians 4.13. You know, I may not have what it takes, but I know Him who does. I know Him who will give me what it takes to get through this life. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh, now this week... We're going to flip that coin. We're going to look at the other side of that coin because these two can be very closely tied together. And the lie today is you can fix it yourself. This is the lie of pride. You refuse to ask for help when you really do need it. You are desperate to hide the mistakes you make when the only hope for healing in your life, the only hope for recovery is revealing it is the lie that causes us to not admit fault in our lives, to not admit that we are incapable. And it causes us to insist, I can do this for myself. I can do it for myself. So last week, you don't have what it takes. 
is the lie of insecurity. This week, you can fix it yourself is the lie of pride. And the enemy knows that if you buy into this lie, God will suddenly not be necessary in your life. If I can do it on my own, then I don't need God. And that's the lie that Satan wants us to believe. And when you struggle with this, it may not necessarily be an inanimate thing. This it, I can fix it myself, uh, could be a person. And you're saying, I'm going to fix it. And maybe the it is sitting beside you. Don't look at it. Okay? But we get, to, we get to thinking that way. We get to feeling that way. We feel like it's my job to fix him, to fix her. And you're raising a bunch of little it's that you think you've got to fix. You've got you to fix these people. You've got to fix people around you. And, and you begin to think, if I just read enough books, or if I get the right book, if I take enough notes, if I go to enough classes, I attend enough seminars, I could not only fix me and the it I'm married to and the it's I'm raising, but all the other it's around in the church and everywhere else, I can fix them. And you, you begin to move around trying to fix people. Let me ask you, how's that working for you? <laughs> do people like to be around you when you're acting that way and doing that? Do you have a whole lot of friends gathering around saying, fix me, fix me? No. People begin to shy away from you and don't want to be a, around you. It just doesn't work. And we find our identity in fixing others. Because when we, when we see success in their lives, we're filled with pride because we fixed them. But when they mess up, when they make mistakes, then we feel uh, guilty. We feel the pressure. We just didn't do it well enough. So what happens with this lie is it creates either a spirit of pride or a spirit of insecurity. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe your it is not a person. Maybe your it is a financial situation. I can fix it. Maybe your it is an addiction. Maybe it's marriage difficulties. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe your it is a secret sin. And the enemy whispers in your ear, you don't need anybody's help on this. You can fix it. You can do it on your own. And they don't want to help you anyway. And bottom line, God doesn't care. He really doesn't care about you. And this lie is appealing especially to American Christians. Especially. Why? Because we are a people of independence, aren't we? We are self-sufficient. We value self-starters. We value self-sustainers. And it marks our culture. We are taught at an early age, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Take care of yourself. You can do it. You can do it on your own. Or the, uh, I mean, some of the first words you'll hear a child say, you'll all remember this, I can do it myself. I want to do it myself. My, my grandkids say it, you know. I'll do, I want to do it myself. And so... That's what, we, that's what we learn early on in life. Or how about the phrase, I got this, I got this. Has anything good ever come after somebody uttering the phrase, I got this, you know? No. And let me ask you this question. Out of all of us here, which one says it the most often, male or female? Male. It's the men. The men, I got this, you know, I can do it. And so last week I talked a lot about the ladies and especially young moms, this week it's you guys. I got this. That's where we get. We get self-sufficient, self-starters, and we think we can do things on our own. We live in the do-it-yourself culture, don't we? we our society believes in this, this do-it-yourself. I don't know if you've ever watched any of these home improvement shows, uh, but I've watched several of them. And you know, very often a typical show, you'll have a young couple that buys a beach house. They're going to have a vacation home. And they're all excited and they're all optimistic. We're going to build this home. We're going to, we're going to uh, revamp this home. We're going to rebuild this home. And then we're going to rent it out during the season and then live in it when it's not being rented out. All of that, everybody's all optimistic and bubbly. And then they find something wrong with the foundation about halfway through the show. You know, <laughs> something bad wrong with the foundation. It's going to cost thousands and thousands of dollars and take months and months and maybe years to get these things fixed. There are termites in the uh, attic or whatever. They always find something, and it does not turn out the way they wanted it. 
And so it is when we insist on fixing our lives ourselves. And we think we can, and maybe it goes okay for a while, but it's going to fall apart. We can, we can just expect that to happen. When we should ask for help, but instead insist on fixing it ourselves, it's only going to become more costly. It's only going to get worse. And the Bible gives us a number of examples of this. The Bible tells us in Genesis 16 about Abraham and Sarah, where God comes to Abraham and Sarah and says, I'm going to give you a boy. You're going to have a baby boy. Sarah, you're going to get pregnant, even though you are over 90 years old. You're going to have a little boy. And that boy is going to be the father of many nations. And, and your descendants are going to be more than the stars in the sky. It's going to be more than the sand on the seashore. You're going to have all of these descendants. You're going to bless the whole world through this boy. And years go by. No baby. No pregnant Sarah. What's going on? So what do they do? They say, we got to fix it. We got to fix this ourselves. We can do it. We can fix it. And so in Genesis 16 too, uh, Sarah comes to Abraham or Abram at the time and he says, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And he does. We'll fix this. I'll go sleep with Hagar. And she gets pregnant and has a baby that they name Ishmael. But Sarah gets pregnant. And boy, you think there wasn't drama then, huh? <laughs> Sarah's pregnant. She has a baby. And so Hagar and Ishmael are banned out into the desert, but God cares for them. And it is the beginning of what is still going on today. It is the beginning of what's happening in the Mideast yet today. All of the conflict between Muslims and Jews and Christians, all of that began on that day when they decided, I can do it myself. I can fix it myself. It can all be traced back to them. 1 Samuel chapter 13 is another example. King Saul had an opportunity to attack the Philistines. But the window of opportunity was closing quickly. He had been told he had to wait for Samuel, the priest, to come and offer sacrifices before he made this attack. But he got impatient and he said, I can fix this myself. I'll offer the sacrifices. It doesn't have to be Samuel, even though God said it did. And so he did. He offered the sacrifices himself as a, because Samuel was running late and he got impatient waiting on him. And so as a, result, as a result of that, God took the crown from Saul and gave it to David, a man after God's own heart. And he lost his crown because of that. And then coming forward in time, in the New Testament, the false teachers in the early church, they called them the Judaizers. And their lie was this, Jesus is good, but he's not good enough. He's not enough. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law of Moses. You've got to be doing all of these things. And so these Judaizers uh, uh, said, you've got to do it by your own works, by your own efforts. So the enemy tells us this lie because he knows that if we buy into it, it's going to cause significant problems in our lives. It's going to cause destruction in our lives. So here is what happens when you buy into this lie. Several things. Number one, it increases pride. I don't need anyone else. I don't need anything else. I can do it myself. I remember years ago, many years ago, when I was still a young man, uh, I decided, and my brother's here today, and he's really good at this stuff. My brother, he's like a lumberjack. He can build anything, he can cut anything. I was gonna cut down one tree, and for me, that's facing death, you know? And so, but I did this. I did this for an elderly person, <laughs> an elderly person in the church at the time needed a tree cut down. So I climbed up in that tree. It was going to fall on her house if I just cut it down, you know. So I climbed up and I started cutting branches down and cut it from the top down, cut the whole thing down. I was so proud of myself. It all went perfect. Everything was absolutely perfect. That tree was gone and she was amazed and everybody was praising God because what I had done. Okay, I did it myself. Well, I took my little chainsaw and I thought, boy, I can cut down a whole lot more trees and I'm looking for trees to cut down. I'm, I'm so thankful I didn't, but that's where it was gonna send me. I was gonna start cutting down giants of trees. Give me some redwoods. I, and I would have killed myself for sure. I cut one down once and, it, and Barbara and John were sitting on the back of my pickup 
and I cut down a tree that was supposed to fall this way and fell right at them. And they, just like in a movie, they narrowly escaped death as they ran away. Because I cut down a tree, well, no more pride, you see. I can't, I j I'm just not built that way. Leslie is, I'm not. You know, I just can't do that kind of stuff. And so if I do well with something, you say, I can fix this myself, and you do pretty good at first, it's going to lead to pride. Uh, the second thing is, it minimizes legitimate problems. Legitimizes uh, legitimate problems or challenges. You say, this is nothing I can't handle. We look at something that's difficult, something that's going on in our lives, and we say, that's not that big a deal. I can handle it. I can fix it. And the, uh, the enemy would love for you to look at your drinking problem and say, that's not a big deal. I can fix it. The enemy would love for you to look at your spending problem and say, that's not a big deal. I can fix it. He would love for you to look at your anger problems. He would love for you to look at your marriage difficulties and say, no big deal. We can fix this. That's what he wants to happen in your life. Uh, the next thing is, it feeds guilt. You know, we grow up with these words, I made the mess, and I need to clean it up, right? We tell our kids that, right? You made the mess, you clean it up. And so, here's what happens with this lie in our lives. I made the mess, all right, and I know it, but I can't clean it up. I try, and I try to do it on my own, and I just can't get it cleaned up. And so, the enemy will wake you up every day and say, you can do it. You can clean this up. You can fix it for yourself. And you try and you try. And when you can't do it, he whispers in your ear, what's wrong with you? And then you're filled with guilt over that again. So it just feeds your guilt. The next thing it does is it worsens the fallout. I can't believe I let it get this bad. This is like when somebody has symptoms of a disease and they know they have the symptoms and they refuse to go to the doctor. And when they finally do go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, if you had only come earlier, if you had only come when the symptoms started, and things can get pretty overwhelming, can't they? And so uh, it also robs intimacy in our relationships. We say, I can't be vulnerable enough to admit that I need help. And this is especially with young men, okay? You got something going on in your life, you really need help, you really need to figure out how to handle something, and your wife is right there who, who may have a whole lot of knowledge about this, or who may have uh, a good heart for this, but I'm a man, and men are supposed to handle things. And so you don't ask your wife, you don't go to her, you don't ask her for her help. And when you would, if you did, she would feel valued and your, the intimacy of your relationship would grow because now you're together. Now you're working on it together. And so if you don't do that, it robs you from that kind of intimacy. Some of us live with this lie every day. And we want to be set free from that, don't we? Yes. We want to be set free from that, don't we? Yeah, I do, okay? And so we want to be set free from that. And here's what the Hebrew writer says to us in Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to th sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Now we need to understand what a high priest is, because we're not Jewish people. And in those days, in the Jewish people in the temple, they understood high priest. The high priest is your advocate. The high priest is the one who sits beside God and speaks to God for you. He is, he is the one who is your pipeline to God. He is the high priest, and he, he is speaking for you to God. Now, if that's true, and it is, then what does this do to the lie that the enemy is constantly telling you? Uh, it is saying that Jesus, you remember the song years ago, Bette Midler, I think, was a singer, God is Watching Us. The name of the song was From a Distance. From a Distance, God is Watching Us. 
He's not watching from a distance, folks. He's here. Jesus came to this earth and became a man. He knows what you go through. He's not sitting on a throne in heaven just kind of, oh, those poor people. Look what they're going through. He knows what you go through because he's been through it. He's been tempted in every way, and yet he did not sin. He enters into your situation. Here's an example of what it might be like for us. If you're sitting there watching TV, and one of these ads come on depicting the starving children in a third world country, your heart might be pricked. You might shed a tear or two. And you say, oh, those poor kids starving over in that country. It's the difference between that and jumping in your car, going to the airport, and going to that country. And entering into their lives, living with them the way they're living, starving with them the way they're starving. Those two, those two things are so far apart, amen? amen? They're so far apart, and that's the difference. Jesus is not just sitting in heavens going, oh man, they're hurting. They're going through marriage difficulties, and I'm so sorry that they're going through that. No, he enters into your relationship if you will stop believing that lie. And, uh, and so what does that truth mean? You need to see the rest of that particular set of verses. Verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to do what? Help us in our time of need. And so it's not like when you go to the throne of God, it's not like going into the office of a banker hoping for a loan. You know, I, I need to refinance my house. I don't, I'm not sure if I'll qualify. What's going to happen? And you wait to hear, you wait to hear what's going to happen. It's not like that at all. He says, you go to the throne of God boldly in confidence that he will help you in your time of need. So we ask for the help that we need. And that's the challenge for all of us this week. If the enemy is whispering in your ear, you better fix this. You can fix it. Turn it around. Turn it around and claim the truth that God is for you. God is for you, folks. He is not sitting in some faraway place watching. He is for you. He is with you. And some of us really need God's help. And we don't understand. Why is he not helping? I really need his help. Why is he not helping me? Well, the reason is because uh, you, if the Bible says you go to him boldly. You approach. And so you need all this help, but you're not approaching. And, and God is just waiting for you to come to him boldly. You can approach him and get the help that you need. God will begin to heal when we reveal. And God does not heal what we conceal. So Satan tells you, you made this mess. You need to clean it up. He says, God doesn't care about you anyway. And if you've been living that way, I am not the smartest man in the world, but I know just enough to know that there is going to be a huge price for you to pay, that there's going to be destruction in your life, that there are going to be terrible things that you have to go with. Your relationships will be paying the price. So tell yourself the truth. Let this truth set you free. Jesus Christ is my high priest. Jesus Christ stands before God for me. Jesus Christ lives in me. Jesus Christ is in this place. Jesus Christ is in this mess. And he will fix it for me if I will let him, if I will go to him boldly. Uh, I want to read you uh, something that I read this week real quick. Uh, it's written by Bishop and author William Willimon. He tells of an encounter he once had with a dying woman. He said that she was in the last stages of lung cancer, just gasping day after day for breath. And it was obvious she was in great pain, that she was exhausted from fighting. And he said that when he would go visit her, she clutched this crucifix that she had. She would just hold on to it daily. And he found out that the crucifix was given to her by, by her grandmother when she was a little girl and that it was carved by a monk in Europe, and it was just this meaningful symbol of her Catholic faith and all that that meant to her. And Willimon says that when he entered the door, on the last day, he could see that she was near the end. And so he said to her, would, would you like me to pray for you? 
would you like me to summon a priest? And he says that with her last ounce of energy, she held out that crucifix, which had the body of Jesus on it, nailed to the cross, and she said, thank you, but I have a priest. We have a high priest. He is for you. He is not against you. He wants you to succeed. He, he wants you to be able to get these things fixed in your life with His help, not on your own. You cannot do it on your own. So start reading Hebrews 4. Read it, the passage that I read today. Read it over and over this week and claim this truth with both hands. Don't, don't let go of it. Claim it and turn it all around. Would you stand with me in prayer, please? Father, uh, help us. Help us to be courageous enough to come before your throne boldly. We ask, Father, for your help. We admit that we cannot do these things on our own, but we need you. We need you to fix things. We need you, Father, to bless us. We need you to save us. We're so thankful that you love us and that you care about us so greatly. Help us, Father, to always look to you for our, our power, for our source of strength in everything that we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day today.